All right, guys, Fire in a Bottle Sunday videos are back. I apologize, I'm a bit under the weather. My voice is probably a little scratchier than normal. My brain is full of fog, so if I say some confusing things, I apologize. I'm gonna do the best I can to pull through this. I know that I've teased several times uh, that we're gonna talk about OxLDL. We are gonna talk about OxLDL and uh, BCAA restriction is a hot topic right now. We're going to get there uh, right now for reasons. I'm on this track of looking at some of these uh, clinical trials with the different oils, and I want to look at the difference between canola oil and safflower oil. This is the trial here that you can see. Um, they took a bunch of, of young men. Uh, I think they were all between 34 and 50, something like that. And they this is a pretty well done trial. They ate this baseline diet, which was some mixture of butter and vegetable oil uh, for three weeks. They measured their platelet phospholipids. Uh, phospholipids are kind of where a lot of the action is in fat metabolism. You store the fat, and of course, in your adipose tissue and your fat tissue, but the membranes are where the arachidonic acid gets uh, released and converted to the oxlams, the oxidized PUFA, and that has effects on all kinds of things from uh, clotting and inflammation and immunity and all this stuff. And so they had this three-week baseline diet of butter and veg oil, and then some of them got canola oil. And you can see here, the canola oil is quite high in monounsaturated fat and it's quite high in, this is alpha-linolenic acid, which is the plant-based omega-3, 18 carbon length, three unsaturated bonds. Uh, this is what's in flaxseed oil, but it's also fairly high in canola oil, and it's also fairly high in soybean oil. And so canola oil has a fair, a pretty fair amount of linoleic acid. It's a 20, you know, a little over 20%. That's quite a bit in my opinion. And then they also give the people safflower oil, and safflower oil is a very pure source of linoleic acid, and it doesn't have nearly as much of monounsaturated fat or alpha linolenic acid. All of the meals are prepared for these people in a test kitchen, so we have a really good idea that they're actually eating these diets, and then they measured the plasma phospholipids, and that gives us a really good idea of what happened in these humans. So I posted the argument on my blog this week that diseases such as obesity and heart disease and diabetes are really just an expression of mammalian torpor. And if you look in the phospholipids, you can see all of the parallel changes happening both in heart disease and in uh, torpor, mammalian torpor, which is the alternative, alternative metabolism where you lower your metabolic rate and favor fat storage. And I've argued that the switch to torpor is actually controlled by certain environmental triggers. And one of those is unsaturated fats because you see a lot more unsaturated fats the further you go away from the equator. So if you think about coconut oil, cocoa butter, palm oil, those are all relatively saturated fats that you find near the equator. You think about acorns, those are in more temperate locations. They're a lot less saturated. And so you can see that in, in torpor, these are, these are bears, and you see that palmitic acid increases in torpor in the winter when they're hibernating. Um, you also see very distinctly that arachidonic acid levels drop. And so this is humans with heart disease, and these are healthy humans, and these are humans with heart disease. And you can see the same thing happens, right? So um, so palmitic acid uh, goes from about 17% up to about 20%. And so you see this big increase in palmitic acid. And at the same time, you see this drop in arachidonic acid going from uh, fourteen six down to thirteen one. And so, for my blog post, I actually lined up. Uh, this is this is dormice between uh, their their summer active season and their torpid season. And this is healthy humans versus humans with coronary artery disease. And what you can see is that in the mice, uh, palmitic acid goes up in torpor. Uh, palmitic acid in humans goes up in heart disease. Stearic acid goes down in torpor. Stearic acid in heart disease goes down in humans. Oleic acid goes up in torpor in dormice. Oleic acid goes up in humans with heart disease. Linoleic acid goes down in torpid dormice. Linoleic acid goes down in humans with heart disease. DGLA goes up in torpor. DGLA goes up in heart disease. Arachidonic acid goes down in torpor and arachidonic acid goes down in heart disease. So uh, we're seeing a lot of coincidences here. This doesn't prove anything. I'm just pointing out that the pattern in heart disease is broadly congruent with the pattern of animals in torpor. How does this work? We start with, so LA is linoleic acid. This is the omega-6 fat found in uh, soybean oil, in safflower oil, and sunflower oil. And the way, what happens is this linoleic acid 
gets converted through an enzyme called D6D, which is a delta-6 desaturase. It puts another, it puts a third unsaturated bond into the linoleic acid, converting it uh, via an intermediate ultimately to DGLA. And then this other enzyme called D5D comes along and converts it to arachidonic acid. Uh, the arachidonic acid can ultimately be converted via the enzymes PLA2, which release it from the uh, membranes. And I've got a little diagram of how that works later. And for instance, uh, the enzyme cytochrome P451B1 is an enzyme that oxidizes arachidonic acid. And once PLA2 has released it from the membrane, uh, this thing can oxidize it and it becomes 12 heat among dozens or hundreds of other potential oxidized lipids that it can become. The expression of D6D and D5D are controlled by uh, the transcription factor PPAR-alpha. And so PPAR-alpha, when it's activated, will increase conversion of linoleic acid to arachidonic acid. And oleic acid and ALA are both things that activate PPAR-alpha. So if the fat that you're eating is higher in these things, uh, you will activate PPR alpha, and you'll convert a higher percentage of linoleic acid to arachidonic acid. And so the question I'm asking in this video is that, so linoleic acid is the starting point of, of 12 heat. And so the question here we're sort of asking is, what's more important? Is it ultimately the amount of linoleic acid that you consume, or is it the activity of these enzymes that are actually converting the linoleic acid to the oxidized lipins? And so here we are in the membrane, and you can see my beautiful diagram. Um, this is a phospholipid. You can see the phosphate group on here. And these things have different positions. So this is a glycerol molecule. It's the same thing uh, when they talk about triglycerides. These glycerol molecules can store up to one, two, three fats, except in the membrane, instead of uh, having a third fat, they have this phosphate group. So they only have two fats in the membrane. This one in what's called the SN1 position, you don't have to memorize that. There's no quiz. But this one in the SN1 position is typically saturated. Not always, but it's typically saturated. And this one in the SN2 position, that is where the PUFA lives. So this is typically uh, where arachidonic acid exists in membranes, is in this SN2 position of of the phospholipids. In your body, that is where most of the arachidonic acid, in fact, is found. This can actually be lost. This this uh, arachidonic acid can be lost in the membrane, and you end up with what is called a lysophospholipid here. So the LPA2 enzyme, the one that I mentioned, uh, is controlled in part by their uh, hydrocarbon receptor, uh, is what cuts the PUFA off here, creating the lysophospholipid and uh, here you see the 12 heat is now floating, free floating in solution. It's actually transferred in the blood by a protein called albumin. So this uh, PLA2 activity can actually be affected by dietary unsaturated fats. And so in this example, this is another clinical trial. They supplemented people with soybean oil and it increased the PLA2 activity. So, so it increased their ability to release that arachidonic acid from their cell membranes and create things like 12 heat. And I'm picking on 12 heat because 12 heat is also often described as cardiotoxic. If you go to Google Scholar and do a search for cardiotoxic 12 heat, uh, you get all these, uh, you know, you'll get tons of hits. Most researchers consider if you have a lot of 12 heat um, in your blood vessels, this is a bad thing. Okay. So that's all background. Now we're back to that canola oil clinical trial, right? These are the men who, who ate three weeks of the baseline diet that was butter and uh, vegetable oil. And now they've switched to pure canola oil for eight weeks. Um, that's this column here. Um, this is just a comparison group. Again, this is uh, people with coronary artery disease in this column versus healthy people in this column. And we're going to see some uh, very interesting parallels and this is the composition of their diet at baseline and after they're eating the canola oil. Again, this is in heart disease. What you see is you see high levels of 16-O palmitic acid. Interestingly, in the people given the canola oil, you get this big rise in palmitic acid, despite the fact that if you look at their diet, it goes from about uh, maybe 17% on average down to about 7%. And so you see this huge drop in dietary palmitic acid, and you see this increase in membrane palmitic acid. Uh, to me, that is an absolute indicator that the people eating the canola oil have increased de novo lipogenesis. Um, we'll have some slides on that. Um, I just want to quick go through the rest of these. And so again, this is heart disease. You see decreased uh, stearic acid, 
On the canola oil diet, you see decreased stearic acid levels. In heart disease, you see increased oleic acid. On the canola oil diet, you see increased oleic acid. Um, in heart disease, you see decreased uh, linoleic acid. On the canola oil diet, you see decreased linoleic acid. In heart disease, you see decreased arachidonic acid. On the canola oil diet, you see massively decreased arachidonic acid. And this actually looks like the torpid bears. Like the degree, of, if you go back and look at that bear slide, this is about the same amount um, that the that the arachidonic acid levels of the bears dropped in torpor is the same amount as humans given canola oil. I want to point out one other marker that's in the blue. So 14O is myristic acid. It's a it's a relatively uncommon uh, fat in food, but it is found in a decent quantity in butter. It's also in coconut oil. And so when people went from the baseline diet to the canola oil diet, their uh, dietary myristic acid went from about 5% to about 0.6%. So that's like an 85% dietary decrease at the same time. Uh, the amount in their phospholipids doubled. So something is happening to create a lot of this myristic acid in the people eating the canola oil. This is another study looking at blood markers of de novo lipogenesis. And what they did was they just took a bunch of people and they, uh, they, they gave them an isotope tracer. So this is a very accurate way to measure the amount of de novo lipogenesis that means fat making new fat making that they're doing right and so so they very accurately measured dnl and then they compared it to a lot of the kind of blood markers that we use as sort of secondary ways to know if people are doing dnl and interestingly all they did was they split the group in these these people are below the median level of dnl and these people are above the median level of dnl you know and maybe dnl is not bad maybe dnl is just a normal part of biology and doing it isn't bad you're just uh you know converting this fat to that fat or whatever but in fact if if all you do is this say okay well People that are above average DNL, their BMI goes from 26.4 up to 28.1. That's highly significant. Their waist circumference increases by seven centimeters. That's almost three inches. A three inch waist circumference increase if you're doing above median DNL. Body fat percentage is three points higher. Visceral fat is more. Uh, insulin resistance is higher. Fasting insulin is higher. Triglycerides are higher. So all of the indications that we have suggests that doing high uh, DNL is probably not the group that you want to be in. DNL is when we take acetyl-CoA, which comes from really any of our foods, um, glucose, fat, certain proteins, all can be converted into acetyl-CoA. And then fatty acid synthase builds it into mostly palmitic acid, but some of it is actually made into myristic acid. Um, some of it is made into stearic acid, perhaps using an elongase. And so all three of these saturated fats are the primary products of DNL. And so what the researchers found is that the single strongest correlation between isotopically confirmed DNL and a fat marker in your membrane phospholipids is in fact myristic acid 14O. Interestingly, they have this split into the two groups. So this, this group is the group who is... Um, doing above average DNL, you know, they might be genetically inclined to do more DNL. And so in this case, these people, 14O might be uh, more tightly correlated with dietary myristic acid. So maybe these people are eating more butter. In this group, if you see a lot of 14O, it's because they're doing de novo lipogenesis. People, you know, probably most of the people watching this channel who are interested in it are more likely to be in this group than to be in this group, right? And so in your case, if you eat canola oil, you're going to see more 14O, and that's because you're doing more de novo lipogenesis in response to the canola oil. Palmitic acid, of course, is also increased, despite the fact that palmitic acid in the diet goes from 17 down to about 7. And so where is the extra palmitic acid coming from? Well, it's probably coming from de novo lipogenesis, right? Uh, but we have this index called the DNL index, and what it measures is palmitic acid divided by linoleic acid because when people are doing a lot of de novo lipogenesis what you see is that the linoleic acid is being converted to arachidonic acid it's being made into oxalams and you're doing a lot of dnl and so palmitic acid is rising this dnl index was first written in the literature in 1996 right this is not a new concept you can see at baseline before they ate the canola oil their dnl index was 4.3 
And after eight weeks of canola oil, their DNL index goes all the way up to 5.7. So that's a pretty dramatic increase in this other marker of de novo lipogenesis. In the group that is isotopically proven to be doing DNL, this is the relationship between their DNL index and the amount of DNL that they're doing. So this DNL index is isotopically proven to be a very reliable marker of DNL. And so people in the canola oil group are clearly doing more DNL on account of being fed the canola oil. And so that brings us to arachidonic acid. Now, this index, uh, there's another index called the D5D or the delta 5 desaturase index. This D5D index has been used in a lot of studies to predict diabetes incidence, etc. And so we have a lot of evidence that uh, having a low D5D index is probably pretty bad. This is a study looking at membrane phospholipid composition and how well the different phospholipids predict diabetes risk. And they're looking at exactly uh, what I'm talking about here, which is D5D index, uh, delta-5 desaturase, right? As this D5D index increases, this is the number of people who develop diabetes over the next five years. So if you have a very low score, uh, 204 people in this group develop diabetes. Whereas if you have a very high score, only 55 people in this group develop diabetes. And so you really want D5D, you want that number to be high. And canola oil is pushing you down, right? Canola oil is pushing you into the high risk category of developing diabetes. And so you see the canola oil is causing people to do more DNL. That is extraordinarily clear that people given canola oil are, are doing more DNL than people giving a mixture of butter and vegetable oil. It is also clear that the canola oil is causing arachidonic acid release from the cell membranes and it's causing an increase in oxalams and oxylipin release in the blood. And it's, it's pushing you into a high risk category and you look like the torpid bear rather than the summer active bear, right? All of these things are true. Okay, so we're back to, uh, this is the final comparison of the whole trial, canola oil versus safflower oil versus the baseline diet of uh, butter and vegetable oil, right? The baseline diet of butter and vegetable oil easily beats both canola oil and sunflower oil on the basis of de novo lipogenesis, the amount of de novo lipogenesis that the people are doing. This couldn't be more clear. Uh, myristic acid is at 0.43 at baseline in the canola oil diet and goes to 0.81. It's at 0.4 in the safflower oil diet and goes to 0.65. Those are statistically significant results. Um, the DNL index is higher in both cases. Uh, palmitic acid is higher in both of these diets, despite the fact that dietary palmitic acid goes way down both on canola oil and safflower oil. Full stop. People eating these vegetable oil diets are doing more de novo lipogenesis. It is unquestionable. Now let's look at D5D. How much of that arachidonic acid is being released by PLA2 and getting converted to 12 heat and the other phospholipids? Well, D5D at baseline in the canola oil is 4.4 and it goes all the way down to 3.2. In the safflower oil based diet, it goes from 4.3 down to 3.9. So in both cases, the butter and vegetable oil diet beats the individual vegetable oils but in fact, the one that is the worst is the canola oil-based diet, right? Because if you activate PPAR alpha, the reality is that both of these diets are providing sufficient linoleic acid to cause all of these problems. But then the question is, which diet is going to activate D6D and D5D more and PLA2 and things like that and cause bigger problems? And it seems like eating a mixed diet that provides sufficient linoleic acid with a lot of things like oleic acid and alpha linolenic acid that are activating PPAR alpha is actually worse than eating something like safflower oil that is like an almost pure linoleic acid. Um, I'm not saying you should eat safflower oil. I'm saying you should eat butter. Butter beats both of them handily. And if you look at the canola oil-based diet, you can realize that this is why acorns, I've argued in my video in the past, how to fatten a mammal, that acorns evolved to have the most fattening combination of fats because they have to fatten squirrels so that the squirrels can survive winter, so that the squirrels 
can spread the acorns so that the trees can reproduce. Acorn oil is mostly oleic acid, which activates PPA or alpha when you eat it. And therefore, I expect that the canola oil diet is should be worse than the safflower oil diet. And this clinical trial in healthy adult male humans shows that that is indeed the case. Have a good one, guys. I'm going to work on my voice. We're working closer towards looking at Ox LDL. Uh, we're going to have some stuff coming up on uh, BCAA restriction, branch chain amino acid restriction. Uh, if you haven't been following along all the discussion on the blog and on Twitter, um, and we're going to talk more about glycine, of course, and connective tissues and uh, pig's feet and tendons and, uh, and all of that kind of fun stuff. Uh, keep following along. I will see you next time.